right?
Did you bring your car? I think that we didn't post for the You mean, Oh, my God. I think we I think we All right, it's uh, one o'clock. Let's go and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good. 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 That sounds good. All right, we're week nine, so you know we're uh, you know uh, very very much uh, you know getting to the second half for sure. So we're we're just about done with economics. So after after we finish with replacement analysis, we have one more unit on inflation, and then uh, I have an entrepreneurship workshop that will probably run next Thursday, and then that'll be it for economics. And so after, and so after that, we'll be talking about ethics for the rest of the rest of the semester. Okay. All right, and so uh, and so you know that's that's kind of the plan. And so you know we're going to finish up replacement analysis today, uh, get started with inflation, and then keep going with that. All right, so some announcements. Uh, remember, homework four is due this Thursday, and so uh, remember that's the homework on tax and replace and uh, rate of return. Okay, and so make sure you're working on that. And if you have any questions, just uh, just let me know. Okay. Um, Okay, and then uh, and, and then as soon as that homework is due, as soon as homework four is due, I'm going to post homework five. Okay, so uh, so homework five will be a little bit, uh, you know, it'll be a little bit shorter, uh, and the the amount of time you have to work on is a bit shorter too, just because our midterm will be coming up right after that one is, is due. All right, and so uh, that's it for my announcements. Are there any uh, questions I can answer before uh, we begin class today? All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Oh, I guess uh, you know maybe personal story first. Well, not so personal, but my dad. My dad was at the the Chargers game last night, and then this is his third game in SoFi Stadium. Um, but for some reason, every time he goes there, the, the the game goes into overtime. So I texted him and said, "You're getting you're getting pretty good value for your tickets because not only you get four quarters of action, but you get overtime." But at least the Chargers won yesterday. The last couple of times he went, uh, the home team has lost, and so. He actually went home happy yesterday, although the game wasn't super exciting. So. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's pick up where we left off. So um, the we were talking about replacement analysis. Uh, and remember, you know, replacement analysis, we are answering the question of, you know, we have an existing asset, we have a machine that we've been working with in our company, and we want to know if it's economically feasible to replace that asset. Okay. And so, of course, you know, you can apply this to any to any aspect of your life, too. You know, you don't have to just limit it to just, uh, you know, engineering economics. Uh, but this is a good question to know in general, because, you know, especially nowadays, uh, our lives depend on a lot of devices, a lot of technology that we that we that we use every day. And so it's always a good question to ask, you know, when when would be the best time to replace it? And if you remember, you know, there are two things that we are computing, or there are two things that we have to compare. And so on the one hand, we have to compute what's called the marginal cost of ownership. Okay. 
And if you recall what that is, that's uh, basically the cost of your existing asset to own it one additional year. And so if you were to keep your car for another year, if you were to keep your phone for another year, you know, this is going to be the cost. And remember what we talked about last time, that there, there's a couple factors that actually go into this. You know, on the one hand, you know, of course, you have to factor in things like maintenance costs uh, or any kind of, you know, risk of, of large breakdown, right? So that's, that's, that's a flat cost that you, know, you would have to pay. But you also have to take into account that if you own an existing asset for an additional year, its value is going to depreciate. And so if you were to sell the asset a year from now, versus today, you know, of course, you're going to get less money from it a year from now, in most cases. And so, and so both of those factors have to go into the marginal cost. Um, and so, you know, we did a couple examples of that last time. And I have uh, one more example I'm going to do today to show this. Okay. And then the other, um, the, other, um, uh, the other factor to consider in replacement analysis is the economic life. economic life and EUAC of ownership of a new asset. Okay. And so if you were to do the replacement and you were to replace it with another part, um, you know, first of all, you should know, you know, how long you should keep it in order to make it economically feasible. And then also you want to compute what's the yearly cost of ownership for owning that asset for that period of time. Okay. And it's important to note that, uh, you know, these, these two ideas kind of come together. So economic life and EUAC, you know, they're, they're linked. And so, you know, in order to make the new asset worth it, you have to keep that asset for that amount of time. Okay. And so these two things are going to be compared. So you have the marginal cost as well as the minimum EUAC, okay? And then you're gonna see which one is low. And so in the case where the marginal cost is lower, and so in, in that case, the uh, it's not gonna cost that much money to keep your existing asset, then in those cases, you, you keep it, you don't replace it. Okay. <clears throat> And so in that case, you know, your existing asset, you know, maybe the maintenance costs haven't caught up that much. The salvage value is still going to be really high even a year later. And so, uh, you know, there's no reason to sell it. Okay. But in the other case, when the marginal cost does exceed the minimum EUAC, This is when you replace because you know it's going to cost you more to keep that asset for one more year than it would be just to buy a new one and just you know um, and keep it for a certain amount of time. Okay. So this is the primary kind of decision that we're making here. Okay. Is we're comparing, we you have to compare both, you have to compute both these things, compare their values, and based on on where their values are relative to each other, then you can either um, you know go to keep the asset or to replace it. Okay. All right. So that's kind of what we're doing here with replacement analysis. And so, you know, there's two, there's two parts to it. And so you can almost think of it as, you know, you're doing two different problems. Um, but, you know, you need kind of both pieces of the puzzle in order to make, you know, the decision whether to replace it or not.
All right, so that's just a kind of a recap of, you know, just kind of this whole unit in general. And so are there any, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, and so let's go ahead and continue our example from last time. And so um, I'm not going to redo the whole marginal cost calculation just because, you know, we, we did that at the end of class, but I will kind of summarize the results. And so from last time, we were looking at a particular engineering machine that's used uh, in a company. And what we found was that the marginal cost um, was the following. And so I'm just going to list out the, uh, I'll just list out the first three, first three years. Okay. And so if we were to keep the, uh, if we were to keep the machine for one more year, we would incur a marginal cost of 13,750. For the second year, if we were to keep the, um, if we were to keep the asset from um, year one to year two, that would be 13,800. And then from year two to year three, that marginal cost would be thirteen thousand eight fifty. Okay, remember these are marginal costs, and so these are not these are not the total costs. And so if you were to keep it, you know, from one year extra, that would be you know from year zero to year one, that would be thirteen thousand seven fifty. And then from year one to year two, just the just the cost for that year would be thirteen thousand eight hundred. Okay, so this is this is like a yearly a yearly cost. And so when you put it like that, these are basically like an annual cash. Rate, okay. So gen and so you know generally the the trend for replacement analysis is that we do it with annual cash flow analysis just because that you know that makes the most sense. And so the next part of this example, you know, with that in mind, is to do the second part. Okay. And so um, now that we've computed the marginal costs, the next step is to compute the economic life and minimum EUAC of a new machine. And so we're going to compute that, and we're compare we're going to compare those numbers to the marginal cost. Okay. All right, so let's uh, let's go ahead and list the stats. And so um, for this machine, this machine has an initial cost of twenty five thousand dollars. All right, maintenance costs. Maintenance costs are going to start at two thousand dollars per year, and uh, they're going to increase by five hundred dollars per year. All right, and then we have the breakdown risk, right? And so remember, you know, this, this breakdown risk isn't an actual cost, but it's it's just a way to kind of quantify if this were to break down, um, you know, this is the approximate cash value of, of that. Okay. Remember the way the way that we usually do this is that we take you know the initial cost and we multiply it by you know the percent chance that we think the, the asset's gonna break down. Okay. All right, and so uh, for this particular asset, we have we add a we add an additional five thousand dollars to our risk if um, the n is less than three. Okay, and so if it's a fairly new machine, um, 
you know, which is pretty high for a new machine, then we're basically saying that we have a 20% chance of breaking down, okay? Because 20% of the initial cost is 5,000. And so that's how we get that number, okay? And then outside of that is we're gonna have our base uh, rate of 15,000. And then each year, we're gonna add 1,500. Okay. okay. And then we have the salvage value. So the, the salvage values in this case, in this problem, were given in a table. Okay. And so all we have to do is we just Take a negative of it for this value is from the table. Okay. And I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and list that table in a second, just so that you can see what that looks like. Okay. So the salvage values. And I have, we have seven years of data at the end of year one is going to be 22,000, year two is 19,000, 16,000, 13,000, 10,000, 7,000, 4,000. And so actually the salvage values are fairly straightforward here. It's just going to depreciate by $3,000 per year. Okay, so we have basically a straight line depreciation um, of $3,000 each year. Okay. All right, so those are all the stats for the, uh, uh, for the machine. Uh, but remember, to, in order to do... Um, economic life calculations, we have to convert all of these to a uniform series. Okay. Excuse me. And so I'm going to do all those conversions in red. Okay. So first we have the initial cost. And so remember the initial cost is always a present sum. And so to convert that to a uniform series, we do A over P. Okay. We do A over P. Um, oh, I didn't put it here. So we'll assume the interest rate here is 15%. Okay. And so do A over P, 15%. And of course, the n value here um, is going to is going to depend on you know what year that we're looking at. Okay, so we're going to leave that as as blank. Okay. Next, we have the maintenance cost, and so we know the maintenance cost starts at two thousand dollars per year, and so that is already a uniform series format. Uh, but then we have the increase, and so this increase five hundred is like a gradient, and so we have a plus five hundred times a over g. 15% and N, okay. So we took that gradient and converted it to a uniform series. Next, we have the breakdown risk. And this is this is actually a little bit challenging. And so, you know, this, uh, this is actually gonna be a triple conversion, okay. And so first thing we need to do is, uh, well, first the $5,000 for the breakdown risk, those are already in uniform series format. And so we don't have to, we don't have to convert them, but we do have to convert this increase. So we have a $1,500 increase. Okay. And this is non-standard because this increase doesn't actually start at the standard time. This is actually gonna start in year four, okay? And so to, to do this, 
we're going to need a P over G conversion, 15% and minus two, okay? Because this increases, you know, it's not starting at its usual time, it's, it's delayed by two years. And so that takes our gradient and then converts it into a single sum. Okay. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to take that uh, single sum and then transport it to year zero. And so we need P over F, 15%, two. Okay. And so that second conversion is just a simple, just a simple, you know, um, one off. Okay. It's taking a future sum, converting it to a present sum. And then the last step here is to take that present sum in year zero and then spread it out over all of the years that we're looking at. And so this right here is an A over P, 15% and N, okay, where N is you know, the number, number of years. Okay. Right, so the very rare triple conversion. And so I think this is, this is probably one of the only places that we'll see it in this class. Okay. And then finally, for the salvage value, uh, the salvage value can just be done in a single step because remember the salvage value always takes place at the very end of the of the period, and so this is just going to be simple a over f, fifteen percent, and n. Okay. We're going to separate these two. All right, so it's a lot of a lot of conversions, but you know, um, I wanted to do this all kind of upfront right here because once we get to the table, I'm just going to start listing out the, the numbers. Okay. Uh, any questions on on this and kind of how we did these conversions? Yeah. Oh, for the break. Uh, how do you know the Yeah. Yeah. Let me let me go ahead and draw. I think it might be a bit easier to draw. And so I'm just going to focus on just this 1500. And so if we go ahead and draw. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And so we know that this increase is only going to happen uh, when n is greater than three. Okay. And so. Um, you know, if we just did this fifteen hundred dollar increase, okay, it would look like this. And so, you know, year three, we don't actually see any increase there because that's the uh, because you know gradients always start a year later. And so we would see something like this. Okay. Okay. And then, if we were to extend this for year seven, if I Drew my dots a bit better than we have one more year there. Okay, we want to convert this. You know, it's uh, it's kind of a delayed gradient, and we want to we want to convert this to a uniform series that goes from years one through year six. Okay, um, and so it's it's basically going to be a standard uniform series after. And so the and so there's there's lots of ways you can do this. Um, and so you know one way that you can do it is um, you know, using the three conversion there. And so first thing I did was I said, okay, I have these three here. Let me go ahead and convert this into a single sum. Okay. And that single sum is going to take place on year two, right? And so, um, you know, that's what the, that's what the P over G conversion does. Right. And so remember when you uh, convert a gradient to a present sum, you skip, you kind of skip a year because that first year, year three in this case, doesn't have any, any increase on it. And so you go down to year two. Okay. So after you convert that, you're going to have a single sum right here. Okay. Okay. And so the next step in order, in order for us to actually spread this out over all six years, we actually need to take this and move it back to year zero. And so this right here is the P over F, 15% two, okay. All right, so that's the second conversion. 
And then now that we have the, the cash flow on year zero, we can spread this out over all six years. And so that's going to be the A over P, 15%. M. So it's, it's quite a roundabout way. And, and the reason we have to do this is because uh, there's no A over F, or excuse me, there's no G over F conversion. Because if you're able to do a G over F, you can take that gradient, put it all into a, a sum on year six. And then because that year six is at the end of the period, then we'd be able to spread that out using a uniform series. But because there's no G over F, we have to kind of do this roundabout way where we have to take it, you know, we have to take it to year zero. And then once we're in year zero, we can spread it out using the A over P. Okay, any questions, any more questions on, on this? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and uh, start listing these out. And so I'm gonna make my economic life table. Okay, remember, uh, for each of the columns here, we're going to list out the different cash flows, but converted to a uniform series. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and so let's do the initial cost first. Remember, the initial cost is simply just the 25,000 times the A over P conversion. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and write out some of these. And so as you can see here, the initial cost is going down, right? Um, that's because, you know, the remember, the longer that we keep an asset, the, the impact of the initial cost goes down over time. It's because, you know, we spread that cost over, over, more, over more years. Okay? So we start really high um, because, you know, we haven't really spread it out yet. And then as we go down, the initial cost goes, goes down from there. Okay? All right, maintenance. So, so our maintenance cost is going to be $2,000 in year one. And then each year is going to increase to the gradient. And so after doing the conversions for those, we have the following. And so if you look at the maintenance cost, you know, we start low here, but because it's an older asset and as the asset gets older, it gets, it gets more and more expensive to maintain it. And so our maintenance costs are going to go up. Okay. Okay. Same is going to be true for the breakdown risk. And so for the breakdown risk, remember, we start at $5,000 per year. And then after year three, that's when, um, you know, that's when things start to get, uh, a bit complicated with that triple conversion. Okay. okay. And so as the as the risk of breakdown increases as the asset gets older, then you know that breakdown risk is gonna um, you know get higher.
Okay. And then the longer you keep the asset, the salvage value is going to go down. And so you can, you know, we can see the impact of that um, there as well. Okay. okay. And so once you have everything, uh, the last step is just to add across the rows. Okay. And so, or, excuse me, add across the columns. And so we have an EUAC for each, um, for each row here. Okay. And so that's the EUAC of, of ownership. If we were to keep this asset for one, two, three, four, five, and so on and so forth. Okay. All right. And so let's take a look. Let's take let's take a look at the at where's the minimum here. Okay. Remember, this is an economic life calculation. And so we want to find the minimum EUAC. And in this case, you know, it's kind of a unique case. Um, you know, the minimum EUAC here is actually going to be in year one, right? And so the most economically feasible thing to do for this for this case is to just keep the asset for one year and then sell it and then, and then buy a new. Okay? It's kind of an interesting thing, though. you know, even though this may be the most economically feasible, I think in a practice in, in practically, you know, this may not be you know, the thing that that, uh, um, that you may want to do because, you know, that's, that's getting a new machine every year. And this is assuming that the machine stays the same cost every year, which, you know, we're going to talk about soon with inflation. And so this may, you know, you may get an interesting result like this from the economic side, but practically speaking, you may not want to, to do this. Okay. Uh, but it's good, it's good to know. And it's maybe good to know for the, uh, for the, the company that manufactures the machine to say, you know, maybe you need to restructure your pricing a bit to uh, make it more worth it to keep the machine for longer. Okay, uh, any questions on how we did that calculation there? Okay. All right, and so this is part two of the uh, of the replacement analysis. So remember, um, you know, this is in addition to the marginal cost analysis that we did before. Okay, so if I can kind of scroll up here. And so, you know, if we assume that we, we currently have a machine with these marginal costs, and then we compare that to the minimum EUAC of a new machine, okay, what we see here is that in year two, you know, it's going to cost us $13,800 to, um, to keep that machine running, okay? And so if you compare that to our minimum EUAC from this problem, which is $13,750, this means the, the best thing to do would be to keep your existing machine for one more year, but for that second year, just go ahead and replace it, So we did kind of two problems uh, for one example, and this is the this is the result. Right. All right. Any questions on on this? Okay. All right. And so that's the that's the whole process. And so that's that's uh, you know everything you'd have to do to do an entire replacement analysis. Let's do one more example just so that you can kind of see um, you know the whole process uh, again. All right, and so let's uh, 
so let's let's assume that we work for a mobile bakery. Okay. And so let's say a local local bakery is considering replacing one of its you know very large industrial ovens. All right, and so this is since this is a replacement analysis, you know, we're again going to do two two different problems, and so we're going to do a marginal a marginal cost um, computation for the existing oven, as well as an economic life calculation for the new oven. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about the new oven first. And so a new oven, a new oven would cost eighty thousand dollars. And this eighty thousand dollar price tag will actually include the price of the maintenance cost for the first two years. Okay. All right, so that's so that's not that uncommon. And so you know, usually when you buy a big piece of equipment, a uh, big piece of commercial equipment, then the uh, um, then whoever's selling it to you will, will also give you some kind of warranty or some kind of protection plan, and that's 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 kind of part of that. Okay. Okay. And so besides that, um, you know, after that new oven is, uh, um, you know, after you go through those two years, then you start to incur some maintenance costs. Okay. And also, uh, you know, we have to take into account that this new oven, its value is going to decrease each year. Okay. And so let's go ahead and summarize both of those into a, into a table. Okay. So we have data for five years here. And so in year zero, you know, year zero is right when you bought it. And so, um, you know, it's going to have a value of $80,000 there. Okay. So that's the, that's the initial price tag. And uh, we don't have any maintenance costs there. Okay. Then after that, the, uh, the salvage value or the book value or the market value or, you know, whatever you want to call it is going to decrease each year. And it's going to decrease according to the following relationship. Actually, we only have four years of data. I delete the fifth year. All right. And the maintenance, you know, we know because we bought the, uh, you know, we got the warranty with the oven. So the first two years, the maintenance is covered. And then starting in the third year, we're going to have a maintenance cost of 1000 and uh, in year four, we're going to have a maintenance cost of $3,000. Okay. okay. And so the other part that we need, to, we need for this problem is the old oven. And so this is the one, this is the one that the bakery is currently using. And we can we can write out basically the same information. So we can list out the salvage value for the new oven, or excuse me, for the old oven, as well as its yearly maintenance costs. Okay, we have four years worth of data on it. All right, first thing we're going to list out is the salvage value at year zero. And so if we were to, if we were to sell the old oven today, right now, put it on Craigslist, you know, sell it, sell it there, we get $20,000 for it, okay? 
And then of course, if we sell that oven today, then we don't have to worry about maintenance costs. And so we don't have any for that. And then the salvage values are going to decrease according to the following relation. Okay. And so in year one, after year one, it's going to be seven, worth 17,000, then 14,000, then 11,000, then 7,000. Okay. And since it's an older oven, you know, it's, it's costly more and more each year to maintain it. So it's going to be over nine thousand dollars each year to maintain maintain the oven. Okay. All right. So here are all the numbers, and so you know, I I, I chose an example. You know, I know because the last example took you know quite a bit of time, and so you know, I picked a simpler um, example with simpler numbers here, just so that you know you can kind of see the whole thing. Okay. And so with this information, we want to determine. We want to determine if it's if it's economically feasible to replace our oven now, and if not, when is the best time to replace it? And so basically, you know, what we're doing in this problem is we're doing a full replacement analysis. And so first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a marginal cost analysis of the old oven and then an economic life calculation for the new one. Okay. Uh, but before we do that, are there any questions on just the setup or the numbers for the problem? Okay. All right. So let's jump right into it. And so let's start with a uh, marginal cost. Okay. And so remember the marginal cost, this is going to be the yearly cost to keep the oven for, you know, for one more year. Okay, so let's go ahead and set up our table, um, which, you know, you don't need for every single problem, but it always, I always find that it helps just to organize the, the numbers. Okay. And let's go ahead and list out uh, the old salvage value and the new salvage values for each year. Okay. Remember, you know, when I say old salvage values, what I mean is the salvage values from the previous year. Okay. And so in year one here, Right. What we're going to put for the old salvage value is actually the salvage value in year zero, right? And so if we were if we were to sell the if we were to sell the oven in year one at the end of year one, and then the old salvage value would be the one the salvage value for year, which in this case is twenty thousand. The new salvage value, which is the the one at the current year, that's the one that we take from the table. Okay. Right, and so for year one, the old salvage value is 20,000, and the new one is 17,000. Okay. For the maintenance, we know that it's uh, um, 9,500, okay? <coughs> and then I'm gonna continue listing the, uh, all the other quantities.
right? So those are all the numbers for this problem. And so we're now ready to compute the marginal costs. But remember, you have to be careful with marginal cost. And so, you know, I think people get it mixed up because, you know, we, we talk about this in the same unit economic life. You know, we haven't done any conversions yet. We haven't done any formulas. We've just, we've just listed the cash flows. And so remember the formula for marginal cost is you're going to take the old salvage value Okay. You're going to multiply that by one plus I. Uh, did I put the interest rate? The interest rate is 10% for this problem. Okay. Sorry, I keep forgetting that. Okay. okay, so you're going to take the old salvage value, multiply it by I plus one. You're going to subtract the new salvage value. And then you're going to add the maintenance costs or operating costs. Okay. All right. So if we do all those things, we get the following uh, costs. Okay. So if we were to keep it for one more year, it would cost us fourteen thousand five hundred. From year one to year two, that's uh, fourteen thousand three hundred. From year two to year three, that's uh, 14,100. And then year three to four, that's going to be 14,900. All right, so now that we have the marginal cost for the old oven, let's go ahead and compare that to the economic life for the new one, okay? All right, and so just like we, just like the previous example, you know, we're gonna do an economic life calculation. And so we need to take all of the cash flows for the new oven and convert them to a uniform series. Okay, and so for this problem, you know, we don't have too much, and so we basically just have the initial cost, uh, the maintenance, and the salvage value. Okay, and so the initial cost, remember, was eighty thousand dollars, and we did convert this to a uniform series, and so this is, we're going to convert it A over P, ten percent. And N. Okay. All right. Our maintenance here is going to be a little bit complex, um, just because we bought that, you know, that uh, that protection plan. And so, if N here is one or two, then we'd have no maintenance. All right, and so starting in year three, that's when we start to have maintenance costs. And so we start, you know, if we scroll up back up here, we start with a maintenance cost of $1,000. And so we need to convert this to a uniform series. Okay. And so I'm going to do this in two steps just to make it flexible. And so if you were strictly in year three, you can just do an A over F because that $1,000 takes place at the end. But I'm going to keep this flexible so that we can use it, use the same formula for year four and beyond if we want to. Okay. And so to convert that $1,000, which takes place in year three, and we convert that to a uniform series, first we do a P over F, so P over F 10% three, and then we convert that to a uniform series, 
as a over p 10 percent n and then if we're in year four we have three thousand dollars and so this three thousand dollars since this is going to be the absolute end i'll say this is going to be a over f 10 percent and n if n is equal to four and so if n is equal to four you take we're going to take the one thousand dollars from the previous one and just add this additional three thousand here Okay, and so that's our oh, salvage value. Forgot about that. So salvage value. And so salvage value in this case, we're going to do a minus, and we're going to take the salvage for that year, which remember we obtained this from the table. And then we multiply this by A over F, 10%. All right, so let's go ahead and list these out. Okay, and so we have year one, two, three, four. All right, so let's go ahead and start listing these out. So the initial cost is going to start high. Remember, our initial cost at this case was eighty thousand dollars, and so we convert that to a uniform series. That's eighty-eight thousand, okay. and this is going to go down each year. For the maintenance costs, this is what we get. And the third column there is, is the salary value. Right? And so remember all of these numbers we just got from plugging into those cash flow conversions up there. Okay. And so if we add across these rows, we get an EUAC, 13,000, 12,762, 12,131.5. And then for the fourth year, we have 12,762. Okay. All right. And so as always, you know, we're going to look at this and we're going to find the minimum number. And so the minimum EUAC in this case is in year three. Okay. So the economic life for this oven is three years. And so that gives us the most, uh, you know, the most bang for our buck, you know, before the maintenance costs start to go up through the roof. Okay. And then the minimum cost of ownership for that one is twelve thousand dollars, five hundred thirty-one uh, and fifty cents per year. Okay. All right. Uh, so any questions on how we did that calculation there for the uh, economic life? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Um, it's been a while since I ran the numbers for this, but uh, you could be right. Um, I think you might see you might have seen a, a bigger drop because the you see a bigger drop in salvage value in the last year, and so norm and so up to that point, the salvage value was going down by three thousand dollars per year. But in that last one, it went down by four thousand. So that's that's why you might have seen a bigger bigger jump. Um, 
but I, I haven't ran these numbers in a while, so you may be right. It might be thirteen thousand nine hundred, but if I had to guess, I think that's that's the reason why. It's the difference. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so, speaking of marginal costs, you know, now now is the time we kind of combine these two analyses together. And so, if the new oven, if the minimum EUAC is twelve thousand five hundred thirty-one. But to keep the old oven for just one more year costs fourteen thousand five hundred. Then you know you can see that it, it makes a lot more sense to just buy a new oven. Okay, and so if we buy the new oven, and we keep it for three years, then we only incur a yearly cost of twelve thousand five hundred, which is two thousand dollars less than to keep the oven for one more year. Okay, and so in this in this particular problem, it's better to replace replace now and then keep the replacement for three years. All right. Any questions on, on this example here? Where we uh, wrap up replacement analysis. Okay, all right, and so that's replacement analysis, and so you know they, and so you know the examples they they take a while, and so you know we basically just did two examples for almost an hour here, but um, you know hopefully that kind of gives you a good a good idea about how these can work. Okay, and I think I think you know these problems you know very similar to tax problems, um, you know not the hardest problems in the world, but they can be very tedious. And I think where people make the most mistakes is just kind of just not being organized. And so, um, you know, you may, you know, I know I said drawing the table here is, 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 is optional, but it really does help because if you, if you draw the table, then, you know, you can really start to see if you, if you make any mistakes, because if you don't see certain trends happening, like you don't see the initial cost going down, you don't see the maintenance going up, then you probably know something's wrong. So, you know, I would say always err on the side of, you know, let me do just some additional work. Let me just be organized that you know that helps make things a lot a lot easier okay. okay and so for the last 20 minutes of class today i'm going to go ahead and start the next unit which is on inflation okay so this is our last our last major unit in the economics portion of this class Right. And so after inflation, um, you know, this is this is this uh, this is also going to be the last topic on midterm two. And so after inflation, you know, we're just going to move on just almost completely on. on that. Okay. All right. And so inflation, you know, I think less so than previous years. I, I, I don't really have to introduce this idea all that much because it's in the news basically every day. Um, and so, you know, if, if you listen to the news at all, you probably heard about inflation. Um, if you go to the store at all, uh, or you go out or if you buy anything, you, you probably felt the effects of inflation. Um, and so, you know, we're going to be talking about it. All right. But, in, and, you know, and the reason I kind of left it for last is that it's, it's a little bit of a different perspective than what we've, that we'll, what we've been looking at. And so, you know, up until now, we've kind of been looking just kind of purely on the cash side of the economics. Okay. Inflation is the other side. So instead of looking at you know the amount of cash that we have and how can we make the best use of that cash, inflation is more about you know what are the price of goods that are out there uh, in the market. Because having cash is great, but you know most people use that actually use that cash to to buy stuff. And so you know you could have all the cash in the world, and so you could have like you know a bajillion bajillion dollars. But if everything in the in the world costs a bajillion 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 dollars, then it doesn't really matter, right? And so your your cash and the amount of money that you have is only as valuable as the price of goods that are out there in the marketplace. Okay. 
And so, you know, uh, for this unit, we're going to talk more about just cash. And so we're going to talk about the kind of purchasing power that the cash has. And so when I talk about purchasing power, what I mean is the value of the goods that you can buy with the cash that you have. All right, and so you know, generally speaking, you know, whenever we do talk of price differences, we only say in, in inflation, okay? And so inflation basically is means that the price of goods generally increase with time. Okay. And that's that's currently kind of what we're experiencing. And so, uh, you know, food, gas, you name it, every the price of everything is it's going up. Okay, we do have we do have the opposite of inflation, which is deflation. Okay, and so deflation means that the price of goods is going down with time. Uh, so it's not impossible, you know, we, we have gone through stages or periods of deflation in, in certain markets, um, you know, over, over time, uh, you know, the, the first one that comes to mind is, is the big housing crash in 2008, okay, um, and so if you, uh, you know, if you kind of remember from that time, uh, in 2008, there was a huge, we called it a housing bubble, and so um, housing prices kind of went through a period of very, very steep inflation, and then they realized that people can't pay for houses, and they can't keep their loans, and so the prices of houses just crash after that. Okay, um, and so usually, you know, usually the, they, we don't use the term deflation. Usually, when prices decrease, usually use the term crash. But it's it's more or less the same thing. It, it's kind of more just how quickly how quickly it happens. Okay. Uh, but but you know, generally speaking, over the long periods of time, you don't have deflation over a long period, and so we just talk about inflation because that's that's generally what happens. All right, and so in this unit, you know, we're, you know, we only have about a week to do this, and so we have today, Thursday, and next Tuesday, and so you know, there's there's a lot that we can talk about with inflation, you know, a lot uh, regarding current events, uh, but we're, you know, just kind of everything, just like everything that we're talking about in this uh, in this class, we're just going to go over the basics, just so that you can kind of, you know, join the conversation, just so that you kind of know what's what's going on, but, um, you know, and we're going to do some calculations based on that, but nothing, nothing too too intense. Um, all right, any questions on, on this so far? Okay. All right. And so now that we know uh, kind of what inflation is, let's talk about um, the causes for inflation. And so this is interesting because you know I have I have four causes here, and you know all four of these are, have kind of been in play recently in, in in terms of affecting you know the price of goods. All right, number one. So the number one um, 
cause, and, and this isn't listed in any order. And so, um, you know, I say number one, but this isn't the, this isn't the primary cause. It's just one of the causes. Okay. Um, although you know, some people would argue this is probably the, the driving cause to today is the money supply. All right, and so what I mean by the money supply is the absolute amount of money or the absolute amount of uh, um, you know currency or cash that's out there in the economy as a whole. Okay, and so that amount of cash is going to affect how much prices are the price of goods. Okay. And so generally speaking, the more money there is out there, um, then the price of goods is going to go up. And so, you know, in most in most times, you know, the money supply is something that's that's very tightly regulated by the government. So we have we have an agency called the Federal Reserve, and usually the Federal Reserve is responsible for you know printing a certain amount of money, um, you know, to make sure the economy is 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 going. But you know, the last few years have been anything but usual. And so, you know, one thing that's happened recently has been a lot of the stimulus checks that have gone out uh, to help people get through the pandemic. Um, and so, of course, that's that's basically just the, the government printing a bunch of money. And so you put that money in people's hands, then the amount of money in the whole economy goes up. Okay? Um, you know, uh, when when the big when the first big round of stimulus checks went out last year, you know, there were a lot of news reports that, you know, the, the check that most people got was $1,500 that, you know, stores were starting to sell goods for that $1,500. And so as soon as those stimulus checks started going out, you can you can go to Walmart and see, you can buy a new TV for $1,500. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a very, you know, very clear example of what, that, of, of what that is. Okay. But I will say that usually, Usually the Federal Reserve regulates this, but you know, we're having a pretty difficult time with, with the certain with the uh, uh, with the economy right now. Okay. All right, number two is exchange rates. And so uh, the relative strength of, of, you know, of the economies of certain countries will affect the price of goods as well. Um, so I say that one we haven't seen as much, but you know we've seen the dollar kind of go up and down, you know, throughout the last couple of years as well, um, especially as you know other other economies like the euro or like um, you know so on and so forth. You know, depending on on the relative strengths, prices can be adjusted based on that. Okay. All right, so this one's a big one. And so uh, number three here is what's called cost push inflation. And so um, this happens when the prices of goods 
increase when companies push their operating costs onto the consumer. Uh, and so, you know, what we've seen from a lot of companies over the last couple of years is that their operating costs have gone up. And so, um, you know, you've probably heard in the news of all the issues with supply chain. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's costing a lot more nowadays to, to ship things, to transport things, logistical costs have gone up. And so, you know, in, in order for a lot of these companies to stay uh, profitable, you know, they have to kind of push those costs onto the consumers. Okay? Some more, some more fairly than others, but, you know, that's at least a lot of companies justify it. Okay. okay. And number four is what's called demand pool inflation. And so um, this is just the simple, the simple concept of supply and demand. Okay. And so if the demand for a certain good goes up, then the price is going to go up as well. And so you saw a lot of this during the uh, um, during the pandemic as well. So the pandemic was such was such a very interesting um, you know world event because you know it made it, it brought a lot of industries kind of to a screeching halt, but then it made other industries just the demand for them skyrocket. And so um, one example of this that happened recently was the real estate market. So um, demand for houses and you know and, and real estate just just went through the roof during uh, during the pandemic. Um, and that was also fueled by other things like, you know, like the, like the feds keeping interest rates really low, but, you know, because of that, when you, what we've seen is that the prices for housing and rent and all that stuff just went through the roof just for, from that. And, it, and most of that was because of demand was because of a, a, a really high demand for those, um, for those things. And so these four, and so these four, um, you know, um, effects here, you know, some, and during certain events and not some certain, some of these can, uh, can have greater effect than others. But generally, the net effect for all of these is that prices just tend to increase over, over time. Okay, and that's not including you know other things as well, like like world events. Like of course we have you know the war um, in Ukraine. You know that's 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 you know causing gas prices to go through the roof as well. And so you know, but generally speaking, these are kind of the four I would say the four usual causes for inflation. But you know, like I said, the last four the last few years have been anything but usual. Uh, any questions on on this? Okay. All right. So there's two more minutes left. Uh, I don't really want to get into the next thing because, you know, I kind of want to start that with a fresh mind. And so we'll, uh, we'll stop here for today and then we'll pick this up on Thursday, um, you know, talking about more about inflation. Okay. So remember our homework is due Thursday. And so if you, um, you know, if you have any questions, um, you can stop by office hours. And so I have office hours tomorrow. I have office hours Thursday morning, um, or you can send me an email. So thank you guys for coming today. I uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day, and I will see you all on Thursday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.
Yes, and so for the aircraft, um, what was the what was the timeline for that? I think that's a five a five year asset, right? Yeah. And so for a five year asset, you're gonna you need to have a fifth year here. Okay. And so from here, um, you know, we're not doing straight line depreciation. We don't need that in there. Okay. And so you know, I'll I'll, I'll I'll give you the hint for the first year there. And so for the first year. You know what you're going to have is you have the bonus, which is good, and so the bonus depreciation here is two two hundred forty three thousand. One forty three thousand seven fifty, and so that's that's depreciation that you're going to take off of year one, but then you're also going to add in the macros depreciation for that year, and so I don't have the table in front of me, and so and so you did this correctly where you, where you subtract those two, and so after you after you depreciate the two hundred forty three thousand. You have the seven hundred thirty-one thousand left, yeah. and so you would take seven hundred thirty-one thousand times uh, seven hundred thirty-one thousand two fifty, and then you're going to multiply that by the macros rate for that for that year. And so actually, we can go back and look. And so that would be I think yeah, like seven. Kind of like understand like the return to Yeah, mm -hmm. five years. Yep. And so let me just double check. Uh, aircraft. I don't even have it here. You know, let's just well, let's just assume that's a five-year property, but then you'd you'd have to look in the notes to really see. Okay. And so for the first year for a five-year property is 20%. So you do back. numbers. Oh, okay. So you take 20% of that. And so you would take, you know, whatever this is. So 243,000 seven uh is it 750 or two? 750 yeah. plus the 731,250 times 0 0.2. And that's your depreciation amount for that first oh, for that first year. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and then for the and for all the following years, you know, the, the bonus depreciation only takes place in the first year. So, like in year two, you have seven hundred thirty-one thousand two fifty, and then you multiply whatever the rate for that year is. I think the, the for the next year it's zero point three two. So then that would be the what, depreciation. What that's the same number. So this so this seven hundred thirty-one thousand is the same as this one. Okay. And so that's that's the amount. So you're going to use that every year for the oh, MACOs. Okay, got it. For the depreciation, right? Yeah. You just you just multiply whatever by whatever the rate is for that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And for the before tax cash flow, just like yeah, right. So for the before tax cash flow, you know, for the for year zero, you put the initial cost. And then years for all the other, you would put the revenue. For okay, because the revenue is not giving the problem. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So for this one, for this one, you, I just want you to compute just this column right here. So this is just this is just the depreciation schedule. And okay. so there's no, this is not a full tax problem. So I just want you to do this column. Oh, only depreciation. Only the depreciation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question. Yep. If your marginal cost is cheaper for three years than your minimum um, EUAC, then would it be better to keep it for three years then replace it, or is it just okay? It's 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 it depends it depends on how patient your company is. Usually they're not that patient, and so usually you know if if it's if you tell someone that if we keep it for just one year, you know it's going to cost more than just buying a new one, then they just Okay. And so in those in those cases, it's kind of a gray area. But generally, generally that doesn't happen. So generally, you think your marginal costs are going to go up. I think that problem is just going to be unique certain Okay. Yeah. Usually, the marginal costs are going to go up. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For office hours tomorrow, are they 